and Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Good morning, and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church, Gallatin. My name is Candace Klein, and it is my honor to be the pastor of this wonderful congregation. We're delighted that you're here this morning, and we hope that you will experience the joy of worship together. The Love and Action Committee is taking orders for t-shirts with our church logo on them. I have seen the mock-up of this t-shirt. It's very well made. It's very good quality. I hope that you'll order several dozen of them, maybe a bushel. I don't know how t-shirts come, but order several. Use them for Christmas presents. Use them to sleep in or work around your yard or advertise your church when you go out. Um, but order several if you can. The price, as you know, um, is better if you pre-order than if you order them after they come in. So you're getting a discount if you order ahead of time. Just saying, you know. I'd like to remind you, too, that the grocery carts are still downstairs, as they always are, uh, to receive your generous gifts for Gallatin Cares and Home Safe. There's a list in your bulletin of items that they need. So when you go to the grocery store or the hardware store, please add a few items to your cart and you can make a profound difference in the life of many of the people of Gallatin and their children and help them to maintain their home. If you can make a dif difference even in some small way, please, please do. There's a lot of hurt out there in the city of Gallatin. And now, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Please keep your masks on and let's greet one another in the peace of Christ.
let us worship our God. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He knows us and we belong to him. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He speaks and we listen for his voice. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He is our joy. <clears throat> Let us join together as we sing hymn, The Lord, my shepherd, guards me well, verses one, two, and three. Knowing how easy it is to wander from the paths of right living, aware of all the shadowed valleys we wander, remembering how we have failed to place our trust in God, we come before God's throne to repent. So let us confess our sins using the words in the bulletin, then silently as we make our own personal confession to Almighty God. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. We talk about love, but our actions betray us. We talk about love, but we regret the poor. We talk about love, but we fail to love one another. Lord, have mercy on us. Please forgive us again and stay with us so that our lives may show our love for Jesus Christ in whose love we thrive in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved God, this is the good news. God will walk with us in every moment. God will fill us with his goodness and mercy. God will bring us home to live forever because God no longer remembers our sins. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our first scripture reading is from John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who, has, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep and sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as I, the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let us sing him. His name is wonderful. Chances are you were in second or maybe third grade when you first learned it, and then you promptly forgot it, even if you recited the whole thing to your Sunday school class. Chances are you learned it all over again in seventh grade when you went through confirmation, and then you forgot it again, even though you'd taken a test. And as you grew older, you heard it nearly every time you attended a church funeral. You know this psalm. You're welcome to say it with me. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. A 
of all the ancient texts and all the glorious texts of scripture, what makes us gravitate towards this psalm? I've officiated at funerals where no matter what their background, no matter whether they were churched or unchurched, they could often at least partially stumble their way through the 23rd Psalm. They know the opening line and the closing line. They know a lot of its poetry. They certainly know the cadence and the rhythm of it. Do sheep inspire us in some way? If you know anything about sheep, you certainly know that they're cute, especially when they're little. When they're little, they don't just move through the world, they leap in the air, but they smell, and they're loud, and they frighten very easily. And there are very few people in the world today who aspire to be shepherds. So what is it, you suppose, that about this psalm that stays with us? Maybe it's that this psalm shows us a picture of contentment. The whole psalm is about how the Lord provides for everything. The Lord makes sure that the sheep want for nothing. But when you think about it, sheep don't really want much. <laughs> um, the right paths, a little grass, a little water, goodness and some mercy. Maybe we resonate with that cup runneth over part. But the cup do doesn't runneth over for a new upgraded kitchen or new golf clubs or a, a vacation cruise. No, the cup runneth over with everyday mundane things. The 23rd Psalm is about the simple life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not be in want. As a young man, King David probably wanted to have cars and houses and computers and smartphones. He would have wanted all the latest stuff. As a young person, we get a house and we fill it. Today, I don't have any more room in my cupboards or my closets or my garage. Now, as more mature people, we come to realize that real wealth, the wealth we need, and the wealth we truly appreciate, is not in material things. No, it resides in the love that you receive from your husband or your wife, from your children and your grandchildren, from your friends and your church family. You have finally learned that God's wealth is the wealth of love coming from people around you. Happiness does not come from the accumulation of things, but from the depth of relationships. And we finally learned that the antidote for the hectic, fast-paced life is found in this psalm. Here in the 23rd, we learn that God makes you to lie down in green pastures. God leads you beside clear, still waters. And God wants to restore your soul. And oh, how we want that. Oh God, yes, I want that. A welcome morning in church, an evening with the family at home, dinner and a movie with the spouse, just a few moments remembering and recalling stories about your children, especially when they were so little. And yes, maybe it's inspiring to see our cup runneth over, but probably if it does, it's not with the, the right things. Because what we yearn for, what we really want, 
is contentment. We talk about how our homes and our basements and our attics are filled with all that stuff we've collected and we need just a little time to sort through it all. We talk about needing more hours in the day and more days in the week when what we really truly want is just to stretch out on a lush lawn by still waters with nothing at all but goodness and mercy all the days of our life. My dear friend Mary has a very large piece of property in the hill country of Texas where neighbors have rented her land to put their cattle to graze on it. They're not her cows. She doesn't know anything about cows or grazing, but she often sits on her front porch and watches those cows moving ever so slowly across her land. And she speaks of how peaceful it is just to be there with them, just to watch them, to have a cup of coffee in the morning and speak to no one, need very little and accomplish nothing. It's just wonderful. Now, most of us have come to know that sheep are really not smart enough to play a game of fetch or frisbee, but sheep can generally figure out where to find food and water. But if the shepherd doesn't keep them moving, sheep will overgraze. So a good shepherd stays with the sheep every day, leading them to more green pastures. But the shepherd doesn't go charging out in front of the sheep, shouting orders to them, here, sheep, 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 sheep. Come this way, turn, turn this way, sheep. No, sheep don't respond to orders that are shouted. So the shepherd leads them from behind. He talks gently and the sheep overhear what he's saying. Sometimes a shepherd sings to them, but she never raises her voice to her sheep. She never shouts at them in anger. And so they follow her, not because of her authoritative directions, but because the sheep trust her voice. They know the shepherd's voice and they're reassured as he sings gently behind them, encouraging those who are straggling, assisting those who are injured or weak, directing those who can't find enough food, helping the unfortunate or the lame. Sheep have good instincts, but they need someone to watch over them and lead them to green pastures and still waters. I doubt seriously, however, that Sheep are aware of how much work the shepherd does on their behalf. How much the shepherd does to keep them from danger. The wise and capable shepherd transforms the wilderness into security and safety, guiding them around danger. He will not permit the wolves and the coyotes to be a threat to his sheep. He defends them from all predators. He's always on the lookout because sheep are vulnerable creatures. Of course, on occasion, when a shepherd falls ill or has a family emergency, the, the new hire may be someone brought in to look after the sheep. But hired hands want time off. And at the slightest danger, hired hands will abandon the sheep. A shepherd, on the other hand, will put his own life at risk to protect his sheep. They may even sustain wounds received from wild animals whom he had to fight off to protect his sheep. And the sheep seem to know the difference between the shepherd and the hired hand. That's why day after day, over rocks and crevices, through shadows and storms, the shepherd stays with the sheep. They know his voice, and he leads them through, usually from behind. 
Maybe because Jesus speaks of himself as a shepherd. It explains why he doesn't shout to us. Jesus knows what we can do and chooses to encourage us to go ahead and act on our own learned experience and our own good judgment. Sometimes we want Jesus to be out in front, giving us explicit direction and signals and pointing out the paths we should take. We wish Jesus would be more direct. Sometimes we really don't want to think for ourselves. We prefer to let Jesus make the decisions so that we might have someone to blame if things go wrong. But instead, Jesus is leading sometimes from behind us, picking us up when we get into trouble, encouraging us to go ahead and trust what he knows that we know. And let me tell you please one more thing that I've told you before, but it bears repeating. The 23rd Psalm was written in Hebrew. You knew that. What we have here is a translation. And we're fair, fairly familiar with the translation, which we understand to say in the final verse, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's what our translation says, but that is not what the original Hebrew says. The original Hebrew says, goodness and grace will pursue me every day of my life. Do you hear the difference? It doesn't say that goodness and mercy will follow me. It says they will pursue me. God and God's goodness will hunt me down. God and God's mercy will keep at it day and night, if necessary, until I am found. God will chase me, track me, endlessly seek me until I am back in the protection of God's fold. God does not simply follow me like walking behind me on a hiking trail. No, God looks for me, chases me in the darkness, in dangerous places, in hazardous areas sometimes, until God knows that I am home again. That's how God looks for you. God pursues you relentlessly, if necessary, because you are precious. God protects you because you are one of God's favorites. You are one of God's beloved. You are one of the sheep of God's herd. And God is not moving on without you. Of all the ancient texts and all the glorious scripture, it's one of the wonderful things that makes us gravitate towards this, the 23rd Psalm. May it be so. My friends, you have heard the word proclaimed. You have sung God's words in the hymns that you've sung this morning, and you've heard the ancient scriptures read aloud. I now invite you to do something very Presbyterian, which is to stand and publicly affirm what it is that you believe based on what you've heard. Today, we use the words from the Confession of 1967, and I ask you, people of God, what do you believe? God's reconciling work in Jesus Christ and the mission of reconciliation to which he has called his church 
are the heart of the gospel in any age. Our generation stands in peculiar need of reconciliation in Christ. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the Father, who became human and lived among us to fill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete his mission. Therefore, the church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. This we believe. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. It is now my honor to go before the throne of mercy on behalf of all of us. Will you join me please as we approach God in prayer? Holy One, we bow our heads and our egos to you this morning. We come before you asking once again for you to heal our world. But we know that we cannot merely pray to you, O oh God, to end war for we know that you have made a world in a way that mandates that humanity must find its own path to peace by looking within ourselves and by first making peace with our neighbor. We cannot merely pray to you, O oh God, to end starvation, for you have already given us the resources with which we can feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. We cannot merely pray to you, O oh God, to root out prejudice, for you have already given us eyes with which to see the good in all people, if we would only use them rightly. 
We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end despair, for you have already given us the power to clear away slums and homeless shelters to give hope if we would only use our power justly. We cannot merely pray to you, O God, to end disease or even a worldwide pandemic, for you have already given us great minds with which to search out cures and healing, if only we would use them constructively. Therefore, we pray to you instead, O God, for strength, for determination and willpower to do instead of just to pray, to become what you intend for us to become instead of merely wishing that we could. So we come here this morning to worship, to give you honor and glory and blessing, and we come before you as we humbly ask you to hear our prayers. Almighty God, we thank you for keeping your hand on those whom we love. We thank you for hope in the form of COVID-19 vaccines designed to eliminate this pandemic. Remind us that you have directed the components of all the vaccines being used. Your intention is for our return to health because you have kept your hands on the researchers and the distributors so there is nothing to fear. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would give us the courage to take the vaccinations and that they may be the beginning of the end of this pandemic. We pray for the family and friends, the bystanders, the attorneys, the judge, and the members of the jury in Minneapolis who heard testimony surrounding the death of George Floyd. We ask you to grant them your peace following such an important trial and its final decision. We ask you, O oh Lord, to teach us how to heal our land. We pray today for all who suffer. We pray for those in our own church family whom we know. We lift up loved ones as we pray for Juanita Fraser, Julia McFarland, Pat Hibbett, Joe Armstrong, Kitty Armstrong, Francis Massey, Anna Gasser, Norma Jones, Bellamy McGuire, Palmer Boland, Jerry Sides, Mary McLaughlin, Kathy Cooper, Tony Walker, Dean Boyers, James Reeves, Sandy Baker, John Hughes, Shelley DeGraff, Doug Hausman, and the family of Harry Marsh. Grant them your peace, O Lord. Creator God, we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Please accept our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, and hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus himself taught to his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing together our closing hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd, verses 1, 3, and 4.
you go from this place out into God's good pastures. Go knowing that God has prepared a place for you. It's safe out there. There is good feeding ground. There is clean, clear, still waters. God has created it for you, the beloved. Go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.